alternate care facility at Wisconsin State Park. The briefing is being aired live on YouTube. And joining us today are Department of Health Services Deputy Secretary Julie Willems Van Dyke and Deb Standridge, CEO of the Wisconsin State Fair Park Alternative Care Facility. As you know, both have been extremely busy responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Deb has spent all of her time standing up the ACF and is taking this hour to answer your questions. So. We know there are a lot of things developing in the COVID world. We're hoping to schedule another briefing later this week, but today we really want to concentrate on the alternate care facility. So we will begin right now with remarks from Deputy Secretary Julie Willems Van Dyke. Well, good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Uh, there are now 158,578 confirmed cases of COVID-19, which is an increase of 3,107 since yesterday. We also now have total deaths reaching 1,536. 57 of Wisconsin's 72 counties meet the threshold of very high disease activity level. That is an increase of two more counties since last week's reporting, and each of them have more than 350 cases for every 100,000 residents that have been identified over the last two weeks. Every other county in the state is at a high disease activity level, and Wisconsin as a whole is also at a very high disease activity level. The number of, patient, of people hospitalized with COVID-19 is at an all-time high. And not only that, that number is also growing. Many of our ICUs are strained and every region of our state has one or more hospitals report, reporting current and imminent staff shortages. Our healthcare workers and our public health professionals are doing heroic work. But with numbers like these, we cannot let them do it alone. That is why at the request of our hospital partners, we are opening the alternate care facility. As of today, it is open to accept patients who will be transferred from hospitals across the state. We are incredibly grateful to the alternate care facility staff, the team at State Fair Park, the Department of Administration, and all of our dedicated partners for their assistance in preparing this facility. It has been our fervent hope that we would never need to use the alternate care facility. But in a crisis, such as a pandemic, we must prepare for the worst and then work to try and prevent it from coming to pass. Today, there are no patients in the facility but the reality is that we are in crisis here in Wisconsin, and so we are ready to accept patients as the need arises. And this is why each of us needs to continue to do our part to stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear your mask to protect those around you, stay home except for when you need to go out for essential errands, Stay six feet apart from each other. Wash your hands frequently. And if you have symptoms or have been exposed, get tested and remain isolated until you know your test results. As Elizabeth said, I'm joined by Deb Standridge, the CEO of our alternate care facility, a person to whom we all owe a big debt of gratitude. Deb has had a long career in executive hospital leadership in our state, and she answered the call to come out of retirement to lead the team that has created the alternate care facilities. Thank you for your service, Deb. We are all so deeply appreciative. Thank you. So we are now happy to answer your questions, and I'll turn it back to Elizabeth to moderate that. Thank you. Um, we will, um, everyone, I want to remind you before we start to maintain audio quality, keep your phones on mute until it's time to answer your, to, to ask your question. And if you are able to do so, so use star six to mute and unmute your phone. Uh, let's begin with Asal Razai from Spectrum News, Wisconsin.
Asal from Spectrum News, Wisconsin. All right, how about Sean Kirkby? Sean Kirkby from Wisconsin Health News. Hi, um, thanks for holding this today. Um, you had mentioned the, um, uh, the hospitals throughout the state are seeing staffing issues and workforce issues. Can you elaborate on how many staff are at the alternative care facility right now and how um, your staff being able to staff it with these shortages across the state? Thank you. Deb? Thank you for that question. Our staff, uh, we have over 50 staff here. We're going to open with 50 beds. Uh, that's what we opened with today. Our staff includes physicians, uh, licensed physicians, uh, licensed registered nurses, medical assistants, respiratory therapists, uh, uh, clerks, social workers, pharmacists, etc. So that makes up our cadre of staff that we have available today as we open up 50 beds. Wonderful. Let's move on to Mason Dowling from WAOW in Wausau. Mason. Hi, thanks for taking this call. Um, does the DHS have any comment in regards to the uh, judge shutting down the emergency order? The order we wrote was in, um, uh, in compliance with the Supreme Court and um, our attorneys are looking at that. Our, my message on this is that the order is in place because we are in crisis in the state and mass gatherings are not a helpful way for us to stop the spread of the virus. And so order or no order, I strongly encourage people in this state to avoid any type of mass gathering, wear your mask, stay six feet apart, and stay home if you are ill. Thank you. And we will move on now again, focusing on the alternate care facility as we have Deb here with Julie. Uh, let's go to David Wahlberg, Wisconsin State Journal. David. David Wahlberg. Hello. We can hear you. Okay, thanks. Um, so you mentioned that there aren't any um, patients there today. Um, I guess that seems a little surprising given how many hospitalizations there are. Um, why is it that there aren't any today and when would you expect to get the first patients? Thank you. Deb? We officially opened today. Right now, I actually, to, to participate in this briefing, stepped out of a team meeting. We have been fielding calls all morning, all afternoon to this time from area hospitals and health systems, inquiring as to first, are, are, are the patients they're interested in transferring to us eligible for admission? So our clinical team are reviewing all of those, as well as going through process and protocol with the hospitals and health systems throughout the entire state to see if it is possible for them to transfer patients down here to the alternate care center for admission tomorrow. Thank you, Deb. Uh, Stephanie Hoff, WIS Politics. Stephanie. Hello, and thank you for holding this and for taking my call. Um, uh, how many patients right now, ballpark answer, are you expecting tomorrow? Them? That is still being talked about right now. Hospitals really, when you look at what hospitals have to do to manage and being one that operated so many hospitals over the years, they are taking a look at their COVID-19 population, what patients are ready to go uh, and be transferred and cared for at the alternate care center, looking almost every single hour in terms of what their bed capacity is, not only to care for COVID-19 patients, but also to continue to care for cardiac patients, oncology patients, those patients in the ICU, trauma patients, pulmonology. People are still having babies. So hospitals are going through that process right now in, term, in terms of, of predicting how many beds they will have available to care for people in their community that also includes the COVID-19 uh, population. So that is why these conversations are very lengthy as hospitals discern what their bed capacity forecast can be, as well as what their staffing resources are. 
So I cannot give you a number because we're still having those conversations and hospitals are still making those decisions. Thank you. Let's move on now to Madeline Anderson of Fox 6 in Milwaukee. Madeline. Hello. You guys said that yesterday you can accept up to 50 patients today or, you know, the first couple of days, but that eventually the facility will be able to accept up to 530 patients. I'm just wondering what needs to be done to be able to get it up to that number. Is it simply just hiring uh, more staff or what needs to be done? Thank you. Deb? That's really based on the information that we receive from hospitals as they begin to assess their bed capacity and their staffing resources. They communicate to us what the potential is for us to receive patients. So today we can operate 50 beds. If we hear from health systems across the state that we need to increase rapidly, we can do so in, in go up to 75, 100 beds within a, in, in a rapid amount of time, again, dependent on what the need is across the state of Wisconsin. We depend on communication from our hospital partners, our health system partners, to help us do a very predictable assessment of the capacity that we need here. Thank you, Deb. The next question goes to Danny Maxwell of WKOW in Madison. Hi, thanks for taking our questions. I was just wondering with the surge in um, cases, um, the alternate hospital opening up today, how close we might be to activating the second field hospital site at the Alliant Energy Center. Is that being talked about already or in the early planning stages at all? Yes, I can respond to that. Um, uh, last spring when we were experiencing our first surge of COVID-19 patients, the Army Corps of Engineers was in the state and did do preliminary plans for an alternate care facility in Madison. Um, in addition, they did site assessments at a number of sites across the state. Um, we have called upon the Army Corps of Engineers uh, to come back and relook at those plans um, in preparation for the possibility that we may need to stand up uh, a second or third alternate care facility. But we also want to maximize the use of the facility we have here in Milwaukee. So once again, um, I will not end a question today without reminding people that this is a crisis situation. I think if you just heard what Deb said, this is not just about if you need hospitalization for COVID. This is about crowding out our hospitals for every other type of care that any one of us could need at any day. So what we need people to do in this state is take this seriously in terms of your own personal behavior to stop the spread of this or the repercussions could come back to haunt you and your family. Thank you, Julie, for that. Let's go now to Dave Koplak from the Associated Press. Dave. Are you on the call? And a reminder, star six to mute and unmute your phone. No, Dave. All right, let's oh, try. Beth, can you hear me? Oh, we can hear can you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I can't figure a star from uh, anything else on my phone here. <laughs> uh, quick question. I, I understand these patients are supposed to be uh, more lower level, I guess. Um, do you expect them to be transitioning kind of quickly in and out of the facility? Deb? What we, we anticipate the average length of stay for the patient to be is anywhere from three to six days. That is what uh, we anticipate. They may come here, they're between the ages of 18 and 70 years old. They may need some additional oxygen therapy, additional medications, additional care, rest, et cetera those kinds of things, low level of acuity, as we say. And if we can manage that here, and usually within three to six days, they're able to go home comfortably. All right, and now Christine Flores from Telemundo, Wisconsin. Christine. Christine Flores.
All right, why don't we try Perry Cruz from CBS 58 in Milwaukee. Perry Cruz. Hi, this is Pari from 58. Now, I'm just curious, um, how exactly are these patients being transported? I'm curious as to what vehicles or methods are being used. Are there any special precautions that are being taken in their transport? Thank you. Deb? Yes, what happens, the process is, once a, a patient is, is um, agreed upon to be transferred, approved by our chief medical officer and chief nursing officer, we contact Gold Cross, who is our vendor, um, our preferred uh, ambulance company that will go to the hospital, pick up the, the patient, and bring them to the ACF. And Gold Cross has all the appropriate, uh, their crew has all the appropriate PPE, um, takes all those precautions very seriously to protect the health and safety of the patient as well as themselves. They bring the patient to the ACF. All right, now Katrina Nickel from WLUK in Green Bay. Hi there, thanks for taking this. So my question is, you know, you talked about previously uh, patients who are eligible or, you know, agree to be transferred upon. So who are these patients that you are taking into the alternate care facilities? Again, the patients, oh, I'm sorry, Julie. That's okay. Again, the patients are between the ages of 18 and 70. They are patients that are in, well, I would say, the last few days of a normal hospitalization. They're patients that may need more oxygen therapy. Uh, they may need additional medications. They may need additional care that we can provide at the alternate care facility. They're not ready to go home yet. They still need medical care. And that's the type of patient that we will care for here at the alternate care facility. Someone who is in the last few days of their hospitalization. Okay, thank you for that. Now, Katie Anderson, WBAY in Green Bay. Katie Anderson. A reminder, star six to mute and unmute your phone. Let's move on to Terry Sater, WISN in Milwaukee. Terry. Yes, good afternoon. So last week uh, we were told on the briefing that hospitals were nearly overwhelmed. There were staff shortages. Uh, today you're saying it is a crisis. Hospitals have had over a week to prepare for you opening. How can there not be any patients on the first day? Deb? It, it, um, Terry, it goes back to what I said earlier. Hospital census varies from day to day to day to day. So for example, I will, I, I will tell you of a hospital that talked to us last week that was becoming overwhelmed, that had uh, limited beds. When we spoke to them again four days later, many patients had been discharged, not just COVID-19, but others like in cardiology, oncology, et cetera, opening up more beds for them. So the hospital census is something that is not um, steady. It is something that's very dynamic that can change from day to day. As a hospital administrator, every morning I sat with my team to go through admits and discharges I anticipated for the next 24 hours, deciding what was going to be our bed capacity, how our staffing grids were going to work out. It is something that we manage day to day. And that just gives you an example of what one hospital was going through last week. Not doing really well early in the week, but was managing fine by the end based on their discharges and other types of factors. And something I would add to that is we can anticipate as we look at the numbers of cases here that this is not going to go away anytime soon. When we are seeing 3,000, 3,100, 3,200 cases per day in Wisconsin. Um, we know some of those people are gonna have very mild illness. They are not gonna need even to see their doctor, much less a hospital bed. But we don't know how many, we don't know where people will get more sick. Um, 
you know, there could be a lot more people sick in one community one day than another community. It, it is not going to follow a predictable pattern. The one predictable pattern it will follow is that some people will get much more ill, require hospitalization, and unfortunately, as we've also seen, for over 1,500 people in our state will succumb to this disease and leave this earth. So it's, you don't know when you're the person who gets COVID, if you will be the one who needs this type of care, or if you will pass it to another family member or friend who will need this type of care. And again, that is why looking at these numbers, we know the trajectory does not look good and we need to be prepared for that. And we need to take action so that the trajectory will start to reverse and go in the downward uh, fashion instead of the upward. Good clarification. Thank you both. Um, let's go to Shemaine Mills, Wisconsin Public Radio. Shemaine. Shemaine Mills. All right, why don't we try Mayan Silver, WUMW in Milwaukee, Mayan. Hi, thank you. Thanks for taking the call. Um, so I was wondering, um, you were talking about uh, there could be a, like other alternative care facilities. I'm wondering if you've learned anything from alternate care facilities in other states and what are the biggest lessons you've learned and like things you are preparing for that could possibly happen based on what's happened in other states. And I was wondering if you had the numbers on how many other states have actually had to use their alternate care facilities. I'm sorry, I do not have that number readily available. Perhaps that is something we can get to you later today, Mayan. And Deb, I would turn to you and say, you know, I know as you stood up the alternate care facility, there was a lot of uh, research done on behalf of yourself and your team. And what lessons learned would you share? Um, the number one lesson, the number one lesson uh, is, let me just back up by saying, we talked to Javits, we talked to McCormick Place. We talked to a couple of the ACFs out in California. Um, and as a matter of fact, just before I stepped on this, this uh, briefing is we had a visit with some people who uh, worked at Javits Place that stopped by the ACF just to say hello and wish us the very, very best. So it was interesting just rounding with them. Number one thing, number one, communication. Communication with your hospitals, with your health systems, with your providers, with everyone. So everybody knows exactly what uh, Deputy Secretary Van Dyke said. What is the situation you are dealing with in your state right now? What is the stress going on with the hospitals in terms of bed capacities? What can you do to step forward and, and help them? We have had conversations almost daily about our admission criteria, adjusting it along the way just to make sure we're partnering well with our hospitals, um, talking with our state partners, talking with our vendors. It's communication, absolutely. So there is absolutely no crack at all in any of your processes and protocols. And be willing, be flexible, be nimble to adjust as the community need calls for you to do so, adjust and be nimble and flexible. All right, the next question goes to Eric Gunn from the Wisconsin Examiner. Eric Gunn. Hi, can you hear me okay? Absolutely, yes. yes. Okay, um, so you talked about um, whether somebody qualifies or is eligible, I think was the term that you used. and. And you did talk about kind of what stage they're in, but can you say more about the kinds of things that <clears throat> might uh, uh, make one more or less eligible? What would be a reason, what would be a situation or examples of things that you wouldn't be able to bring somebody in because they wouldn't be ready or whatever? Deb? Patients that are critically ill we do not care for here at the alternate care facility. So a patient that is, first of all, in the ICU or even transitioning out of an ICU into a step down 
type of care floor at a hospital. We would not care for. There are certain vital signs. They, uh, patients, we, we want them to have a temperature of 100 or less. Their vital signs, such as blood pressure, their pulse, et cetera, needs to be in the normal range. So you think about anybody who's in a hospital and maybe they've been there, they have to have been hospitalized for a minimum of 48 hours before we can even think about uh, them coming to see us. So those types of criteria are in place and that's what we have been reviewing all day long with hospitals in terms of who is eligible and not. Have to be in the hospital for 48 hours, cannot be an ICU patient or even a step down patient. Vital signs I have to be somewhat normal, temperature below 100 or below. They need to be able to ambulate or be able to ambulate with one assist. All right, and now let's go to our next question from Maddie Heim, Appleton Post Crescent. Maddie. Hi, uh, thanks for this call. This question's for Julie. Um, so you had mentioned that um, the um, site assessments for um, if we potentially need a second or third facility. And I was just wondering, um, have any of those been done in the Fox Valley area? Do you anticipate, um, you know, if we need another site that one would um, go in that location just because of how hard we've been getting hit lately? Yes, I, I don't, I, I know the uh, site assessments were done across the state, Maddie. I don't know the specific areas, although I expect the Fox Valley was one of the areas. One of the things we face with the uh, decision about whether we would ever open a second facility is um, it isn't something you do overnight. <laughs> um, and so it, uh, from the point in time you make a decision, it can take four to six weeks to actually construct and staff and, uh, uh, and train the staff and be ready to do everything, which when you think about it is pretty amazing to create a hospital in four to six weeks. Um, but when you're looking at the kind of situation we are, that's why we are so grateful to have a facility of the size that we do that can accommodate as many patients with the kind of leadership we have that could ramp up uh, staffing for more patients very quickly. So um, the other thing I would just say about this that's challenging is one of the reasons the facility is in Milwaukee is in April when we were building it, the the epicenter of the COVID uh, epidemic in Wisconsin was in Southeast Wisconsin. Um, and, you know, if we select another part of the state, by the time we open the uh, and another ACF, the epicenter could be in another part of Wisconsin. As I've often said, this is a sneaky virus that moves um, very quickly. So those, um, you know, the considerations about if and where will certainly do, as you have mentioned, focused on where disease is and where we anticipate to the best of our modeling ability disease may go. But right now um, we're doing that preventive work while we're doing the intervention work of, of maximizing the current ACF. Thank you. Uh, the next question to Isabel Lawrence from NBC 15 in Madison. Isabel Lawrence. Uh -huh. Hi, thank you uh, for taking this call on this question. We've touched upon the types of patients, the low acuity patients who will be served at this facility. What if the patient um, all of a sudden takes a dip or deteriorates? Will that patient then have to be shuttled back to a hospital from whence they came? And what would happen if that hospital is now completely at capacity? Is there the option to shuttle these patients back and forth, so to speak? Deb? What happens if a patient decompensates while they're here? On site 24 seven, we have an ALS paramedic team uh, by Bell Ambulance. They are providing what we call a rapid response team 24 seven here at the ACF. We also have an ambulance parked here at the ACF as well. If a patient decompensates requires hospitalization, they will go to the hospital that is closest to the ACF. That they will be transported by our rapid response team in an ambulance to that hospital. And of course, calls are made ahead of time to that hospital as we are stabilizing the patient and preparing them for transport. So our ALS team, our paramedics know exactly 
exactly what hospital is available to accept that patient within minutes. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Guy Bolton, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. The next question to Guy Bolton. No, Guy Bolton. Why don't we try John Nicer at NBC 26 in Green may, Bay? I, I apologize, may I please um, throw in a question? This is oh, Guy Bolton. Absolutely, Guy. Why don't you go right ahead? Thank you. Um, how will this work for patient choice? If I'm a patient at a, an Aurora or Ascension Wisconsin in a hospital, will I have the option of being transferred to another Aurora or Ascension Wisconsin hospital that has available beds, say in the Milwaukee area? Tim? Those conversations, Guy, happen right at the hospital. Uh, the care team would work with the patient to uh, try to meet their expectations as much as possible. So yes, conversations would happen with that patient if beds were available uh, in a sister hospital someplace in the state. You are absolutely correct. Thank you for that. All right, now we'll try John at NBC 26 in Green Bay. Uh, yes, uh, you spoke you spoke earlier about uh, the ground ambulance transportation. Uh, what's what's going to be the average cost for that, and who pays for it? Deb, did you want to answer that, or would sure. you rather me? <laughs> because the ACF is a non-traditional setting, it is not an acute care hospital. There is no charge to the patient for the ambulance transfer, picking them up or the, the um, uh, taking them back home. There is also no charge for the care that they will receive here. And importantly, their insurance will not be charged as well. And the funding for that comes through the Federal CARES Act. Um, as many of you have heard, we had reserved a significant portion of money, um, uh, upwards of $400 million throughout um, our allocation of those funds, anticipating there could be a day that we needed to open the ACF. And so um, yeah, I think it's uh, showing today that it was very prudent to make sure we always kept those funds in safekeeping to operate this facility. Thank you. The next question goes to Dennis Potts from Advocate Aurora. Dennis Potts. Dennis? All right, what about Shaquille Brewster, MSNBC? Shaquille, are you with us? Hi. Um, quick question for you. Just, I had a question about the facility, but it was asked and answered already. So more generally, I know we're talking about the, uh, you, you mentioned the record hospitalizations, another day of 3,000 uh, new cases. Based on your modeling, based on what you're seeing, is there any sign of hope in the, in the near future that things will slow down, that things are getting under control? Is there any reason that people have to hope right now? There is always hope, Shaquille. That's what keeps us going day by day. And I think um, a couple of things give me hope. One is that we know pandemics come in waves and um, this wave will not last forever. Um, we also know that um, because of the way that the disease um, transpires that you get infected, you can get symptoms for up to two weeks after you've been infected, that our waves often happen in two week cycles. And so um, what's happening today is the result of the exposures that happened 10 days to two weeks ago, which were before this um, current acute nature of the crisis became as clear to us. So my hope is that the people of Wisconsin are really smart people. That's not a hope, that's a fact. They are really smart people. And the hope is that they will take this information and do the kinds of things that if all of us do proper behavior together, we can change the curve on this. So we, 
as I said, doesn't take laws or orders for people to make common sense decisions. Stay at home, don't go to parties, don't go to barbecues, don't just go out shopping for the fun of it right now. Um, try, you know, shop online. <laughs> Uh, uh, go to the grocery store when you need to, go get essentials when you need to, but stay at home, don't interact with large amounts of people, go to work, the doctor, grocery store, the things you have to go to, and wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands, and if we all do that together, we can reverse this trend. Thank you so much for that. Let's go now for our next question to Stephanie Ramos at ABC. Stephanie Ramos at ABC. Hi there. Hi there, are you able to hear me? Yes. Perfect. So a lot of my uh, questions about the ACF have been answered, but generally um, as health experts, what do you think is causing the spike here in Wisconsin? And also, just to confirm, will there be a mix of patients seen at ACF, or is it indeed only for COVID patients? Thank you. You want to answer that second question first, Deb? Yes. Uh, Stephanie, it is, this is for COVID-19 positive patients only. And the spike in Wisconsin is the result of numerous things, but in the end, it is about infected people gathering with people who are susceptible and this disease spreading. I, um, I want everyone to think about, you know, fall comes and how many people get a cold in the fall or get influenza. Um, this is what happens when groups start to gather, especially when they start to gather indoors. And there have been a number of things that have compelled more indoor gatherings um, in the last month or two. You know, schools back in session, many workplaces have brought some of their workers or all of their workers back. Um, and frankly, people are sick of the pandemic and they miss their friends and family and they want life to be normal and so many of us have have taken the risk and gone back out and done some of those things um, because we're social people and that's human nature and so i understand part of what i'm asking people to do to reverse this spike goes against much of our basic human instinct but it is what is necessary for us to reverse this. If we can reverse it, if we can stop the ex accelerating level of this disease, which um, and uh, start to bring it down, we'll be in a better shape to carefully and safely go back to more of our social interaction. Um, but we've got to make a stop at this. The other thing that is contributing to it is when you have two or, you know, just for example, if you have two people exposing other people, you're not going to have nearly as many cases than if you have 100 people exposing other people. And right now, we have thousands of people exposing other people. And so um, the other thing about bringing this spike down is every person who is diagnosed with COVID or who has been exposed to COVID, we really need you to abide by the isolation and quarantine recommendations that public health and your healthcare providers are providing, which is staying home for 10 to 14 days after you're diagnosed or been in contact with someone with COVID. So those are the things we need to do to reverse the spike um, and get us back to uh, more normal activity in our great state here. Thank you, Julie and Deb. And now the next question goes to NBC News. Uh, I, I apologize, I don't have a reporter name. NBC News. All right, what about Sophie Carson, USA Today Network in Wisconsin? Sophie, are you with us? Hi, I'm here. Um, my question is also about staffing, which I know was mentioned at the beginning, but um, are you pl planning on drawing staff from other states and how far have you gotten uh, as far as the ability to scale the staffing from 50 people? Great. Deb? We have staff from all over the United States. 
Um, and we're very grateful for them wanting to join us on the work that we're called to do, the mission that we are here to serve the residents of uh, Wisconsin. We work every day, our staffing team, our chief of human resources, all of our partners at the uh, state of Wisconsin, the Department of Administration, as well as Department of Services, working every day to bring staff on to make sure that we have people, as we have staff right now for 50 beds, we can easily ramp up another 25 and 25 after that. But staff are coming from all over the United States. Many of them experienced, experienced in uh, COVID-19 management of care. And we're very, very grateful that they heard the call and they want to be with us here in Wisconsin. Right, and the next question now to Felicia Brown, WGN America, Felicia. Hi, can you guys hear me? We can hear you, yes. Okay, perfect. It's Felicia Bolton with WG in America here in Chicago. Um, we're taking a look at the national numbers and when it comes to this state, uh, in your professional opinion, why do you think the numbers are so high for you guys right now? Well, I think if you compare us to other states, um, much of this roots back to um, how we opened up. And if you remember in May, we were under Safer at Home, the Supreme Court lifted Safer at Home. And the next day, in fact, that evening, Wisconsin was um, fully open with very few restrictions in place around gathering or limitations on gathering, except in a few localities where local health officers issued those orders. That is very different than almost every other state and certainly from the state, um, the majority of Midwestern states that surround Wisconsin that did more gradual openings over the summer um, and that step by step opened up their state and thus were able to keep disease transmission largely at lower levels. Um, some of those states have also experienced what I previously called COVID fatigue and people let their guard down when the numbers get a little better and start re um, uh, circulating with friends and family and we see um, numbers go up. But we, you know, when the southern states started seeing surges like we saw, you know, the state of Texas, the state of Florida, they closed down all their bars and restaurants. Um, in, in Wisconsin, we do not have that authority at the state level. And so there are some different tools in our toolbox or fewer tools in our toolbox than some of the other states that we have seen. And so that may be a strong contributor to why our state has looked somewhat different. Um, I think if you compare to some of the other states that are also experiencing, when you look at per capita surges in, in disease right now, they are also other states like the Dakotas that had no restrictions on gathering in place. And so um, that's an important public health tool that has been limited to us and not used uh, in some of our sister states that are also experiencing these kind of surges. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question to Lane Kimball at News 3 in Madison. Lane Kimball. Lane, are you with us? All right, why don't we try Jeremy Janine, uh, Urban Milwaukee. Jeremy, are you on the call? Yes, thank you for having the call. Uh, question very early in the call, you mentioned you were fielding calls from area hospitals. Is that to be interpreted as the Milwaukee area or the entire state? It's all yes. over the United States. Uh, sorry, all over the state of Wisconsin. My apologies. We're not quite ready to provide care across the whole US. That's right. It's all over the state of Wisconsin. All right, thank you so much for that. And now Will Keneally, PBS Wisconsin. Will, are you on the call? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Wonderful, thank you. 
I was wondering if you could, um, kind of looking on the positive here, uh, discuss what criteria you would use to evaluate when to close the alternative care facility? Deb, has your team had conversations about that? You know, it, you think about that the alternate care facility was built in, in April. And one of the, one of the great I guess praise I have for our state, for the Department of Health Services and the Department of Administration. They had the foresight to listen to the scientists, to the epidemiologists, to the physicians all over the state that came together to talk about the virus and not say that just that first wave we experienced is one and done. And here we are today. And many of the alternate care facilities across the United States were taken down because people felt, again, that the, the virus had completed its surge. We in the state of Wisconsin said, we're not so sure of that. We want to make sure that we rely on public health and scientific evidence, medical evidence, and have those scientists and public health officials tell us what they can predict in terms of the course of this pandemic. And we were insightful and thank you to the state of Wisconsin and, and all, everyone at Department of Health Services and Department of Administration of having that foresight to listen to the, the medical experts to say, we're not taking the, the ACF down until there is evidence that the pandemic has passed. And so I would uh, just add to that, um, that we'll continue to monitor. This, this is clearly another wave of the pandemic. The pandemic didn't give us a crystal ball to tell us exactly how many waves there will be. Um, I think this experience has shown us that um, we need, as Deb has said, we need to be prepared. Again, we can mothball the ACF again and hold if, if it appears the pandemic will be lasting longer. But I'm also happy to say as we open the alternate care facility, we are also working rigorously on plans for vaccination. And I think at a point in time where we can begin vaccination um, and uh, uh, provide that widely to our population will be another point in time where it will feel safer to say, we probably are not gonna be in need of this excess hospitalization. Thank you. And the last question goes to Ruben Pereira from Telemundo. Ruben, are you on the call? Ruben? All right. Well, why don't we try to go back through? We missed a couple reporters. Um, we'll start with Asal from Spectrum News, Wisconsin. Asal Razai. Spectrum News. Hi, thank you for circling back around. Um, so my question was answered, um, just clarifying that their patients are being um, transported with ambulances. That was my primary question. Yes, patients are transported from the hospital that they are in to the ACF with an ALS crew. Thank you for that. Uh, let's try Christine Flores from Telemundo, Wisconsin. Christine Flores. Hi, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Awesome, so how can you guys assure families that their loved ones will be taken care of or receive a similar level of care as they would in a hospital that they will be transferred, transferred out of rather? Yeah. I didn't. I didn't hear the first part of your question. I apologize. Could you restate it, please? Oh uh, yeah, no worries. So, how can you assure families that their loved ones will be taken care of or receive a similar level of care as they would in a hospital that they will be transferred out of? That conversation takes place at the bedside when the care team comes in to talk to the patient about a potential transfer. We have we have a flyer that we have put together, a brochure for that patient. That the care man, the care team that is has uh, responsibility for that patient will sit down and discuss this possibility with them, answer all of their questions, and again get have them understand what is happening and what the care will be down here. 
So that conversation happens at the bedside with the care team at the hospital before they are transferred. All right, thank you for that. Uh, why don't we try Katie Anderson, WBAY in Green Bay. Katie Anderson. All right, one more try for Shemaine Mills at Wisconsin Public Radio. Shemaine Mills. What about Lane Kimball? WISC in Madison, Lane Kimball. And finally, Ruben Pereira from Telemundo. Ruben. All right, well, with that, we have used up more than our time allotted, almost the full hour, and I want to thank Julie and Deb for participating and all of you on the call for asking such thoughtful questions. We really appreciate you sharing this message. Uh, please continue to monitor our DHS COVID-19 web pages for data, for guidance, and you can always find additional information about COVID-19 and our response on the websites of the Governor, the Department of Workforce Development, the Department of Public Instruction, the Department of Children and Families, and of course, Wisconsin emergency management. We want you all to be safe and have a good afternoon. Thank you so much.